worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. We praise you, God. Lord. We magnify you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated for a moment. As a, a kid, probably my um, dad says it's probably when I was around five or so on. From what I can recall, is at the age of nine, I I desired to be a doctor. But desire alone, it was a medical doctor. Things changed. Desire alone did not make it happen. I had to work. There was some effort. There was some seeking. The Bible says, that, or David says in Psalm, one thing have I desired of the Lord. One thing have I desired of the Lord. As a church, we have expressed, can I say we have desired to see the hand of God, to see God work, but we have to seek after it. In moments like this when the Spirit of God is moving, that's the time to close your eye and begin to focus on God. If you desire Him, if your desire is of the Lord, it will come to pass. It will happen. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the Lord. Do you have that desire tonight? Is that something that you want? You got to seek after it, amen. You got to go after it. It's not going to happen by coincidence, by chance. No, you have to seek after it with all of your heart. Hallelujah. Amen, God, just, just dropped this in my heart as I was coming up, and I just, I can't proceed without saying or doing what God asked me to do. We need to pursue it, church. Desire alone, yes, yeah, good to have a desire. Yes, it's good, amen, to have dreams, but you got to pursue it, amen. You got to go after it, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Go after it with all that you have, amen. God will help you, amen, hallelujah. It will be with you. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. That's not my message tonight. Amen. But I just, I just feel something in the spirit. Amen. To say, you know what? We got to seek after it. We got we to gotta go after it. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. If you don't mind turning your Bible to um, Genesis chapter 6, reading from verse 1 through 8. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh. Yet his day shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fall of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. 
But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. My text, my title is from verse 4. It's entitled tonight, Giants in the Land. Giants in the Land. God, we thank you for your word, God. God, we thank you, for, Lord, for what you have already done, Lord. I pray, oh God, that you will touch me, God. Hallelujah. Be my help and my strength, God. Hallelujah. God, I pray, Lord Jesus, that your, your presence, God, will move, God, again, Lord. Hallelujah. God, do what you please tonight, God. Hallelujah. I have no personal agenda tonight, Lord. God, but that you will move and that you will have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say amen. The Bible tells us that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. The Bible says that they did eat, they drank, they married wives, and they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Such was the wickedness on the face of the earth that the Bible says that it repented God that he made man. There are some folks who said that or try to interpret this as saying that God will regret or thought that he did something wrong. No. You know, if those of you that have kids, amen, there are times when they will do something, amen, and you're certainly not sorry that you gave birth to them, amen, but it grieves you, amen, it pains your heart that they would do something that displeases you, something that you have instructed them not to do. So, so was, was the wickedness on the face of the earth at that time. But something that caught my attention was the fact that there was this intermingling of the holy and the unholy. There was an intermingling of the, or union of the godly and the ungodly. And the end result of that was the presence of giants in the land. These giants were some really big dudes, amen. Goliath was said to be six cubic tall. One cubic is about one and a half foot. So he was about nine feet tall. That's one big guy. In Deuteronomy 3 and verse 11, the Bible tells us about Og, the king of Bashan. He was nine cubits, or his bed was nine cubits, which was about three, 13.5 feet. Wow. That's one big bed, amen. That's one big guy, amen. <laughs> no, I don't think a king would fit him, <laughs> amen. I have a king, and it's not, it's, it's nowhere near 13 and a half feet. What is very clear is that, to me, is that nothing good has ever come out of the intermingling of the holy and the unholy. The mixing of the profane and the unprofane. The union of the unhallowed and the hallowed. Evil and good. Corrupt and pure the unrighteous and righteous. As you begin to study the word of God, it became very evident to me that simply this union, this intermingling had a lasting impact on Israel. They would later have to fight giants. They would later have to overcome these giants because of this intermingling. That's why the Bible is so very clear on this matter. In 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14 through 17, it said, Be not unequally yoked together 
with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion had light with darkness? And what concord had Christ with Belial? Or what part had he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement had the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be he separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean things, and I will receive you. Now, the union of unrighteousness and righteousness no longer produces men that are over nine feet tall or giant, so to speak, as we know it. However, it certainly has produced strange doctrines and ideas. Colossians 2, verse 8 through 10 says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophies and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and powers. I want to read that from the Amplified. It says, See to it that no one take you captive through philosophy and empty deception. Pseudo-intellectual babble according to the tradition and musing of mere men, following the elementary principles of this world rather than following the truth, the teachings of Christ. For in him all the fullness of the deity, the Godhead, dwells in bodily form, completely expressing the divine essence of God. And in him you have been made complete, achieving spiritual statue, through Christ and he is the head over all rule and authority of every angelic and earthly power you see a giant is anything that exalts itself above God we are to cast down every high thing the Bible says these things at times maybe may seem to be far above us to even hope that we'll win against them. Goliath powers above everyone else in Israel, even King Saul, who was the tallest. Israel could not bring him down by, or the, the men could not bring him down by their own power. It requires the help of God. There are intellectual giants. People that seem to have all the knowledge. They are experts, and we are not. How can we stand against their evidence? They are philosoph philosophical giants. People who seem to understand life so much better than we do. At least that's what they say. They are material giants. People who have so much more than we do. Who are we to question what they say or what they believe? As I was studying the word of God, one of the things, Pastor, that amazes me is so-called preachers, so-called men of God, who are preaching things that will tickle people's ears. Preaching things for their own fleshly desires. They are intermingling the righteous with the unrighteous. The godly with the ungodly. They are creating giants that they will have to deal with at some point. You say, what do you mean, Brother Greg? Well, here's an example. I was listening to a preacher and he said, you know, folks have asked me, why do you 
preach so much about the, what do we call it? Alternative lifestyle, so to speak, putting it mildly. And he said, my response is this. The fornicators know that they're fornicators. The adulterers know that they're adulterers. I don't, I don't have to bother with that. But the folks with these alternative lifestyle, they want to believe that sin is okay. They want to be bishops. They want to be whatever. When clearly the Bible states that God is not pleased with. It's now gotten to a point where if you express what you believe, you are said to be intolerant. This is what the intermingling of the unholy, the unrighteous, with the righteous will cause. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Church. It's important, it's very important that as we live for God, to not entertain people who are speaking things that are opposed to the word of God. The simple thing that I thought to myself is, if I do that, then I am essentially sure picking what part of the Bible I'm going to believe and what I'm not how is that going to work out we're simply creating giants when we do that we're creating problems that we are going to have to face in the long run the second instance where we come across giants is when the spies, the 12 spies, were sent to the promised land. And, you know, when we see a giant, when we have to face something that seemed to be insurmountable, there can be two essential responses. We can Address it like Caleb and say, you know what? With God, we are going to be able to be successful. But it shouldn't come as a surprise in some sense that the others were fearful. Can you imagine? My, my brothers, I have two older brothers. Oh my goodness, those guys love to fight. You look at them wrong, the wrong way. They're ready. I've seen them fighting some guys that were bigger than they were. Nobody would mess with me because they were my brothers. Actually, they did try when my brothers weren't there, and I had to show some folks that I can defend myself. Uh, um, I don't like it, but if I have to, I will. But I'm quite confident that if they were faced with somebody who was nine feet and above, they would have some second thought about fighting. Because the thing is, like, these giants, if you think about it, the type of lifestyle that they were living, you know, they would be walking, they had, you know, there were no cars, so they were probably pretty fit. They can do some damage. They certainly can. So it wasn't surprising when they say that we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. So that was the second time, as I read in the Bible, where we saw giants or came across the giants. There were some others, but I'm going to skip forward. We are all very familiar with David and Goliath in 1 Samuel 17. The children of Israel 
Amen. They were gathered together. The Bible says that they pitched their tent in the valley of Elah. Amen. And they were there to fight the Philistine. And there was a giant in their path. In order to be victorious, they had to defeat this guy. And it was very clear that just by simply looking at him, they were already defeated. Have you, found, have you ever found yourself in a position where you're faced with some problem, with some situation that just seemed so unsurmountable? You just want to give up. You just want to give in. Like, there is no way I'm going to be successful. That's how Israel felt. That's why it's important that, like I started by saying, that we don't intermingle or create union between the holy and the unholy because we don't want to create any giant in our life that we will have to face. And so they were gathered together. The Philistines stood up and began to defy the God, defy Israel. Amen. Come on, send me some, send out somebody to fight me. He was teasing them. He was taunting them. And almost all of the soldiers, they were fearful. They were in distress. Here comes David. Here comes David with the right focus right attitude he wasn't thinking about oh I'm going to do this by myself no but he came in the name of the Lord amen the Bible says that it's not by might it's not by power by my spirit said the Lord we know how that story ends David slew Goliath you see, the presence of giant can stir different action, responses, or emotions. I mentioned about Caleb, how he stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. Here's the response of the, 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 the others. Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people is greater and taller than we. So the cities are great and walled up. The heavens walled up to heaven and moreover we have seen the son of the Anakin there. So the presence of something that's so unsurmountable, a giant, can cause distress. The very nature of a giant is that he's huge, he's strong. The same thing can happen to us when the enemy sent a giant in our way. We can become distressed because from a human perspective, it will appear that we cannot win. That's the plan of the enemy. Amen. He wants you to accept defeat before you even start fighting. The other thing that we saw happening with Goliath is that he began to dare the children of Israel. He came out and essentially gave a double dog deer to the army of Israel. He taunted them and he tried to get them to engage him on his term. He wanted someone to take him on alone. He made it a matter of pride. When a giant gets us to engage emotionally as a matter of pride, we will be alone and we will be defeated. The other thing that we saw with Goliath was that he was diligent. This guy came out relentless for 40 days and continued to challenge Israel. Just waiting for someone to be offended enough to take him on alone. They were demoralized. You see, that's 
what the giant tries to do. His desire is to make you feel helpless and hopeless. He wants you to believe that there is no way out and no way to win. I dare say this, but he was dangerous. He could have done some damage to David. He could have killed him. I ask a question tonight. What is there in your life that affects you like a giant? David said in Psalms 3 and 6 that I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people that have set themselves against me round about. Why? Because he had the Lord. The Bible says that Jesus, looking unto Jesus who is the author and finisher of our faith. I, I sometimes have to wonder when I read that scripture if folks really get it. The Bible did not say that he, was, that he is the co-author. The Bible says that he's the author. So why is it then that when, when we're faced with situation that we go to everybody else except God? He didn't say that he's the co-author. He's the author. You see, spiritual warfare is necessary. It is necessary. It is vital. God told Moses that there would be blessings and enemies in the promised land. He promised Joshua that the land, he promised Joshua the land, but told him that he would have to be strong and courageous, that there will be challenges. There's a great blessing and joy in following Jesus, but there will also be battles to fight. They are a necess necessity, and they are real. We are to engage in offensive warfare. We're not called to hold the fort against the giants of life. Many Christians just seem to want to circle the wagon at the church building and hold off the devil until Jesus comes. That's not the plan of God. When Goliath challenged Israel, Saul hid in his tent and just hoped everything would look, work out. We aren't called to run for cover. We're not called to run for cover, church. God has called us to pull down the strongholds. The word pull down means to dethrone. You see, when the Apostle Paul when he preached the gospel at Ephesus, there were many people that were saved. And they realized that they needed to get rid of their idols. And as the people gave up their idols, Many in that city were upset. Amen. But you see, the end result was that the preaching of the gospel resulted in the pulling down of those strongholds. We're called to cast down imaginations. That means that we have to conquer them. We are to attack and conquer imagination of this world. What are these imaginations? They are the deceptive and fleshy way of thinking. Come unto this world system. The Bible says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through the philosophy and vain deceit. I've read this before. After the tradition of men and after the rudiment of the world and not after Christ. You see, in facing giants, amen, we need to use weapon that we can trust. We can't use weapon that we cannot trust. And it's imperative that we understand that there are weapons that we cannot use. They are not going to help us. Brother Mark, what are you, a carpenter? Or you do a lot of stuff. But I can tell you that the, the, the tools that you have are probably not the right tool to, to fix a car. We have to use the right tools. We have to use weapon that we can trust. The Bible says that the weapons are mighty. Not mighty because of our own strength. Right? But through God, the Bible says. He 
You see, we live in a world that we have problems. We have problems in this world. And we have different ways to face these problems. In Galatians 2 and verse 20, the Bible says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We cannot trust the weapons of this world. We must trust the weapons of God. You see, David refused to fight Goliath with the weapon of Saul because the Bible says that he hadn't proven. So David took those off. David took those off and used weapons that he was familiar with. What giant do you face in your life? Do you find other people, circumstances, or things within your own heart and mind coming between you and God? Like I said, we have to look to Jesus. The giant is anything that will attempt to take your mind off Christ. The giant will attempt or will tempt you to embrace the unscriptural. You see, this is one of the huge giants in our culture today. It is a tearing away of the very fabric of a local church. It never ceases to amaze me of the believers who think that church, that people should live comfortable with sin. Never ceases to amaze me. One of the things that is very clear is that when David killed Goliath, he cut off his head. He completely destroyed him. That's what we have to do with trans church. So I implore you tonight don't go unarmed and alone when you're facing a giant. David got counsel. Then he used the tools that God gave him. But probably one thing that I find so important was his focus. While everyone was focusing on Goliath and what he can do to them, the harm that he could do, as David began to talk, David said, you know what? Oh, I come to you in the name of the Lord. He begin to talk about what God had done for him. Amen. How God helped him with a lion, with a bear. His focus was on God. When we try to do things in our own strength, and our own power, we will fail. David did not declare triumph until Goliath was dead. So as a church, as we're facing our giants, amen, we need to be prepared, amen. We need to ensure that we have the proper armor on, as the Bible says in Ephesians 5. We need to be prayerful. We need to be per persistent. You see, the enemy will never let up, amen. So we can't let up, amen. Hallelujah. Surely as David met Goliath, you and I face giants of our own. Though we are many faces, we may try to work it out on our own, but only with Jesus can we win in the land of the giant. Only with the help of the Lord will we win. I church the, the world has gotten to a place now where there are so many folks who don't believe in the word of God if you start talking about God it's strange to them I remember an occasion where 
I was away and I was with two co-workers. I think I was in Italy. And they began to talk about Christians and faith and how it was utter nonsense. In a sense, I, for a moment, I was in fear and distress. Actually, one of them was my supervisor. I didn't know if I should say anything or how this was going to turn out. But the fact is, going there, there was some problem. Going there, there was this equipment that we need. And we're told that another company had it, and we're not going to be able to use it in the time that we need. And I proclaimed when I heard that, I said, you know, the company where that thing is at is the same company that we're working with. And right there and then I said, guys, do you believe that this was a coincidence when we're told that what we needed wasn't there? Do you think it's a coincidence? And they started thinking. I said, you know what? I prayed. And I had faith, I believe in God, that this was going to happen. And I began to talk to them about what God had done for me. No, they couldn't argue with that. You see, I'm saying this because there are times when the enemy, the giant, we be, have us in fear. We don't want to speak. But if we don't speak about what God has done, amen, how are they going to know? How are we going to defeat the giant? As a youngster, I was, you could not get me speak in public. This, I would be, even in my professional career, that was something that I, that was a problem. It was a problem. But I knew that that was a giant in my life that if I was going to be able to be successful in God and do what God wants me to do, then it had to be slain. It wasn't slain by me just stepping back or whatever. I had to address it. I had to fight it. I'm saying this tonight because God just, I'm not sure why God, I said, God, I, I'm okay now preaching something else, God. But there are people that are facing things. And it's time to be courageous. It's time to stop looking through your eyes only. And begin to look through the eyes of faith. It's time for us to stop getting fearful. It's time for us to stop admitting defeat before we even move, take one step. If God is for us, then who can be against us? Defeat will only happen if you don't engage God. If you don't ask for the help of the Lord. I ask a question tonight. What it is that that is causing you to be fearful? What is that giant that is causing so much distress? What is that giant that is so tenacious that is constantly coming against you? You know, something that I failed to say earlier is... We need to be careful. How should I say this? You know, there are times when we have situations in our life, problems, giants. And we talk to folks about it. And I say, folks, Christian, 
people who are supposed to know God and they say, oh, no, it's okay. L leave it alone. You see, that's what David's brother were telling him. There was a giant, something needed to be done. He needed to be destroyed. If Israel were going to have the victory, but his brother, somebody who knows God, or supposedly, I'm sure his dad must have said something to, to, to him about God. But his thing was, David, like, hold your corner, David. What, what, you're just trying to cause trouble. Uh, it's okay. We'll, we'll, live with this. It's, we, we'll live with this giant. That, have you experienced that? You know it's a problem and it needs to change. And somebody's telling you, no, it's okay. Just, you know, it's fine. I, my wife was mentioning something to me the other day and I started smiling or I was like, this is crazy. There are people who believe that it is a plan of God for them to suffer and live uh, as a beggar or whatever. I, I don't see that in the Bible. No, things can happen, right? But how does that make sense? And they won't listen to folks. And then there are those who will tell you that that's okay. You know, that's God's plan. Now, if I'm facing a problem, what I want you to do is encourage me. Tell me to trust God. Don't tell me that, oh, tell me to trust God. Tell me to believe God. Speak faith to me. Don't speak doubt. That's not going to get rid of the giant that I am facing. And one of the traits that I've gotten from my grandmother is that I'm very, what's the word? I'm trying to be nice here. But I will let you know, I'm not, and I'll do it nicely. I'm not going to do it offensively. But if that's your doing around me, you got to leave. Because I, I want God in my life. I don't want doubt. I don't want fear. I don't want, I don't want giants around me. I don't want anything that's going to keep me from getting to where God wants me to go. I don't want anything, as Pastor said this morning, to separate me from God. If we, we can stand tonight. If there is something that you are facing, something that is causing fear, Something that is causing distress. Something that you may think is insurmountable. Seek God. Seek God. He He has the answer. The funny thing is that the odds, immediately when you get God involved, the odds is just completely turn around. It's a completely different odds. Well, it's not really odds because we know God is going to win, but you get the point that I'm making. Like, by yourself, yeah, the odds is you're going to be defeated. But with God, it's of a surety that if you truly believe in Him and have faith in Him, that you will be victorious. You. I can tell you this. For me, it's, it's strange for me when I, I see someone going through something and don't seek God. It's very strange. It's like somebody's trying to help you and you're like, and you need the help and you're saying no. That's just, in my mind, very silly. It's really very silly. You see, there are times when I'm doing research and there are folks who are more knowledgeable in that area. I'm not going to spend six months or a year trying and failing when I can go talk to somebody 
and get ideas and get help. Why would I do that? That's just a complete waste of time and money and whatever. That's what we do. That's what we're doing when we don't get God involved. He said, come unto me. And you're like, no, God, I'm going to try and do this myself. I'm going to do take this trial and fail. and pu-. Why would you do that? And it, it seems silly, but, you know, that's really what we're doing. That's really what we're doing. First of all, there's this thing called the word. Use the word. Use the word. Use the word. And then talk to God. Giants in the land. But more importantly, there's also giants in our life. And in order to get to where God wants us to get to, we're going to have to destroy them. We're going to face them. We're going to face them. But the good thing is that we can and will be victorious. God has given us all that we need to be successful. Let's use one of the things that I like, you know, is when I'm working and I, I face a problem and I'm, I'm talking to my boss about things that I need. I'm like, I need X, Y, Z. And he says, oh, money's not a problem, God, Greg. Just go get it. Just go get it. You have all the resource that you need. Church, we have all the resource that we need. We have everything that we need. We have the word of God. We have the spirit of God. And we have God. What, what else do you want? What else do you need? What else do you need? This, this seems very simple, that, but again... I'm saying this because I see time after time Brother Ocho preach about it so many times. Many has preached about it so many times, but day after day we, we, we seem to struggle or I, I don't know if it's struggle or we, maybe, maybe we just don't want it. No, I get it. No, I get why God ought to, do, to use that scripture. One thing have I desired of the Lord if you desire something from God, go after it. Go after it. Go after it. Utilize the resources that God has given you. Utilize the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Pray through into the Holy Ghost as Pastor said. Amen. I'm done, church. I'm done. These altars are open. Everything that you want, everything that you need is at your disposal. This is not just mere speech because I have taken advantage of this. I have gone to the Lord and seek Him, seek Him for my desires. Amen. And I've seen God work, I've seen Him move against all odds. Amen. When it seemed as if everything was hopeless, when it seemed as if there was no way, amen, God says here, now that you know this is me, this is me, this can only happen because of me, not of your own ability, not of your own strength, but Greg, you know that this is God working in your life. If he has done it for me, church, he can do it for you. He's no respect to a person. He's not a God that he should lie. Oh, come on, church. Seek him, amen. Seek him, amen. Hallelujah. Seek him, amen. Hallelujah. Utilize the power, amen, that's made available to you, amen. Utilize the measure of faith that God has given you, amen. Hallelujah. Activate that measure of faith, amen. Stir up the gift that's within you, amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. You don't have to be fearful of the giants. You don't have to be fearful. You can and will be victorious. 
if you trust God, if you rely on God, and not on your own understanding. Hallelujah.